Our first speaker this afternoon is the head man of Swiss and the person who organized this entire fantastic conference. He's a chiropractor, he's a certified strength and conditioning specialist, has been training in powerlifting and bodybuilding for over 20 years, and is being regarded as one of the people to consult for injury regarding weight training or any kind of injuries at all. So on a personal note, he invited his entire family to come to Ontario to witness this fantastic event. And um, I'm certainly uh, proud to call him my brother. So if you could please help me introduce my bro, Dr. Ken Kanakin. Um, what I found over the years of myself training and also treating a lot of weight trainers, um, I've specialized in weight training injuries because that's the reason why I actually got into my profession of chiropractic. Um, like my brother said, I've competed in bodybuilding and powerlifting for over 20 years, so I have an athletic concept. I've also injured myself and have utilized a number of different types of treatment protocols, um, some of them effective, some of them not effective. Uh, I find all different types of treatments effective, but a lot of times we use them inappropriately or at the wrong time. I'm going to be taking it one step back, though. I want to teach you or show you different ways that you can actually um, measure or at least assess to find out if there is a dysfunction. Because what essentially happens is that if you have 300 pounds and you're going to bench press 300 pounds, if the right shoulder gets injured, the perplexing part of, to me has always been why? Why only the right shoulder? And we, we say that it's the actual bench press that caused the injury. And I'm starting to find out that the actual weight training injuries uh, are not caused by weight training. What it does is it exposes a previous dysfunction that was already there, whether it be falling on an outstretched hand, whether it be uh, being in a car accident, and it may be in different areas that you're not even aware of. You can have a problem within the neck and show up on the shoulder. So there's a number of different ways that you can assess and also treat to find out what is actually going on with the system. Because the whole concept of weight training, which is completely different than any other um, sport, is the amount of overload and stress that you actually put on your body. It's not like a contact sport where it's hockey or football, where you're continually getting hit and it's a sudden impact, you're, you're overloading the system. So you have to have balance and you also have the body's ability, neurologically and also muscular, to find out whether or not there are any imbalances. So that's what we're really going to try and assess here today. Um, the very first page goes over what I'm going to be reviewing here. So we're going to talk about how to use written screens to determine if there's already an unknown dysfunction. We tend to just ask clients that, do you have pain? And if they say no, then we assume that they're okay. Well, you can have a cavity with no pain. It doesn't mean that the tooth is okay. It means that you don't have any pain, but there's still a dysfunction. So I want to show you how I've created some different written screens. The next concept is the concept of sharing versus compaction type of weight training injuries. Now, this is not from a kinesiological standpoint as far as compassion or sharing, it's more of um, what's actually happening with the joints. Determine if a muscle is too tight due to a fascial problem, or determine if a muscle is too tight due to a neurological disorganization or proprioception problem. How to determine the amount of reps a muscle can do, how many uh, sets a muscle is capable of doing during that workout, and injury-proofing recovery techniques, whether it be supplements, electrotherapy, laser, or what is also known as fascial work. So the very first thing that I'd like to go over is the injury proofing screens. And if you go to your next page, this is something that I've created in the last little while to try and get the client to understand that they actually have a problem. Because the biggest challenge is that it's not necessarily from the neck down, it can be from the neck up. You can have the most incredible exercise programs, but if they're not um, 
if they don't think that they have a problem, then it doesn't matter what you do. So this is one of the things that I've created. And number one is, do you have pain while training? None, mild, moderate, severe. And what I've done is I've, I've tried to quantify it. The second one, do you train around an exercise or body part? People habitually say, you know what, I don't have an injury. But they can't squat or bench press because they have something that's wrong. So they just don't do that exercise. Does it mean that something's wrong with them? Yes. You know, the joint should work through its full range of motion. Now, if you do have some type of disorder, whether it's a knee problem due to a surgery or a shoulder surgery or anything else, you should be able to get it back to at least a functional state, depending on either the pathology, the degeneration state, or you know how, how they're capable of. But you want to see how far you can take them. And there's so many different types of techniques and treatments that you can do. You can restore the system. The second one is do you train, um, uh, okay, do you train around an exercise or body part? No, yes. And then this is one that's really important. If it's one specific exercise, it's usually maybe just a technique. So you want to go back into the gym or have your personal trainer, if you're a personal trainer working, or if you're a chiropractor, doctor, you can work with the personal trainer, and that's what I'm trying to set up here, to find out whether or not it's a technique problem. Because if you're squatting like this, you know, nothing's wrong. It's just bad technique, okay? If it's many exercises, you want them to quantify which ones. Now we're starting to work around, is it a muscle or a joint or even a nerve problem? Or even if it's a body part, we're definitely dealing with the neurological area there if they're just completely can't train that at all. How long have you had the problem? Number four is do you fear body compensating by, by twisting? And as we see this a lot of times, and I see it all the time in the gym, that people, when they bench press, one arm is lagging. So the thought is, I'll just do more exercises with that one arm to strengthen it. But we, we assume that the muscle is the problem. It may be, but there may be some other components. The joint may be not working correctly, or even the neurological supply to that area may not be functional. Have you felt the strength decrease in a specific exercise due to a problem? None, mild, moderate, or severe. Now what you do is there's numbers beside all of these different questions, and you add up the check boxes. And then for question two, you basically say, is it one, two, or three? So if you go to the next page on your scoring, and this is for the client to get, because they have to understand that they have a problem. They may not have any pain, but there's a dysfunction. So take, please take your score total and place an X above the corresponding number above or below. So we've got mild, moderate, and severe, so that they can actually start to quantify themselves as far as where they actually are. And they get it. You don't have to tell them. Um, this one teacher taught me that there is a difference between teaching and education. Teaching is me telling you something. Education is me explaining something to you so that when it is done to you, you already self-discovered. It actually comes out of yourself. So with this, this is almost a no-brainer where it's mild, moderate, severe. If they're up in the 13, 14 range, they're going, I didn't know I was that bad. So you take the total score interpretation, and this is what you can use if you're a, if you're a chiropractor, if you're a doctor. You can deal with someone who comes in with a weight training injury, shoulder injury, and they can fill this information out, and now the client starts to understand, okay, this is what I need to do, and then they can work with the personal trainer. Or even better, the personal trainer can have their client fill this out, because the client always usually thinks that, you know what, can you just give me an exercise to try and fix this lower back problem? And sometimes the exercise as well, if that is what the actual problem is. But if it isn't, if there's a joint dysfunction, if there's a muscular dysfunction, if there's a neurological disorganization or proprioception problem, the exercises, will they help? Yes. Will they completely fix it? No. So what you want to do is definitely try and figure out how can I refer someone over, and this is a good way to, to the appropriate doctor, to the appropriate chiropractor, the appropriate physiotherapist, massage therapist, athletic trainer, any of them. So they can check off the different areas. Now, uh, you for if it's between one and five, you want to monitor the area and the exercise if it gets worse. And you want to fill out what is known as weight training injury exam. 
uh, can assess for any hidden problems. And your weight training injury exam, that's what I've been working on recently, is trying to put together um, an assessment based on the actual exercises. A lot of times we assess different types of shoulder problems, um, uh, low back problems, but we don't look at the actual function of what is actually going on. So would, wouldn't it be novel to literally assess the body with the actual exercise to see whether or not what is functional, what is happening with that area. So you can go from uh, one to five, and just that's more exercise technique. Six to 10 is check weight training exercise technique. And you're advised to get an exam, find out what it is. And the exam is anything that the doctor or therapist does. And 11 to 15 is again, you're almost required because it's getting really severe. You're training around body parts. This is the second form. And probably everyone on North America has this one because I sent it out to everyone. I sent out 40,000 brochures, meaning that there's 40,000 people with this form out there right now. And what it is, is just again, an assessment tool. Not to replace any of the tools that you already have or the forms that you have in your uh, protocols, but more of an understanding as far as what is actually going on in the system. So you put name, the date, the area of injury, and then you have the client fill it out, whether it's pain, tingling, numbness, stiffness, in the different areas. Then, did the injury occur with the next size? Yes, no, don't know. It's really important to find out whether or not they understood that during that one set that they felt something collapse, or, which is more the case, where it just gradually got worse. They can't think of the one rep that that arm kind of buckled or the knee kind of fell in. And if it is, then you can find out which one. See, these are the questions that we never really ask. You know, which one exactly did that? The next one is how long have you had this injury? Days, weeks, months, years? And what type of treatment has worked? It's real important to find out. You know, was it massage therapy? Was it acupuncture? And which ones didn't work? You know, that's even more important, so you're not redundant. Now, here's a real key point with this. If it says that, say, um, exercise didn't work, it may be not that the exercise didn't work, it may have been the inappropriate exercise or the inappropriate time or even technique. So just because they said it doesn't work, get them to show you how they actually did it and you can modify the technique and all it is sometimes just some modifications that can make a dramatic difference or they may need to build up to that. Could have been the right exercise at the wrong time. Which exercises causes you pain? and what motion is painful. So with this, if it's the bench press, and as they're bringing it down and they feel it in the, in the bottom one third, then you can start assessing the system under its literally stress point down here. Because the pain in this area is a lot different than in this area. And also, where is their elbow position? Because that changes the entire muscle function and the, the stresses on the actual shoulder. So these are tools that as a personal trainer, you can literally use to refer over to the actual doctor or therapist. And even a doctor or therapist can get the uh, client. I use this uh, in the clinic when people are coming in to fill out, like exactly what are you experiencing? And it saves me a ton of time clinically too. I can get right to the point very quickly. This one here, I came out with the form last year and there's two forms. One is objective, one is subjective. And this is when the body is under stress, you will have different physiological types of reactions. One of which is, you know, decreased appetite, disturbed sleep, decreased strength, decreased recovery, following exercise, increased irritability when lifting, the weight feels heavy, increased incidence of injuries, decreased immunity, catch colds easily, um, dizziness upon rising, depression or rapid mood swings, constant muscle soreness, and increased sensitivity to sunlight. Now, when a client comes in and they're overstressed or they have chronic problems, they've gone through a lot of different types of treatments and nothing holds. This is a real key point, that if, 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 a, if a patient comes in and you do your adjustments and they say, you know what, it only lasts a day. Usually the system is under stress that their ability for the adjustment to work properly or to hold is more of a biochemical issue here. So you have to start working, finding out biochemically, are they under an undue amount of stress? 
Now, there's a number of different ways. The three that I use clinically when I'm talking to clients, have this fill out, but these three that you can use. Number one, are you sensitive to sunlight? And if they say yes, I ask them, do you have to wear sunglasses when you go out there? They have what's known as photophobia. The other test that you can use is you can use a light, and what you do is you shine it about 45 degrees and into the pupil. And what should happen is the pupil should constrict. It should stay constricted. If it starts to expand, it means that its ability to produce enough hormones to make the pupil constricted is diminished. So therefore, the person is under stress. Okay, so that's just one objective measure that you could use. So the subjective, are you sensitive to sunlight? Objective, you could use this. The second one that I use is uh, if you get up quickly, do you get a little lightheaded? And if they say yes, then again, that's another one. Now, there is, I've been looking for something like this for a long time, and it finally came out. How many people here have heard of heart math? One, one person. Okay, this measures stress. How many people work in a corporate type of uh, facility, either training or training corporate clients or anything else? Two? Okay. You guys just don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> this is something that you should look into. Um, go into the website, it's called heartmath.com. They're out of Colorado. They have done an incredible amount of research. And what they've done is they found that the heart should have some um, flexibility as it beats. What I mean by that is that the heart should not beat one second, one second, one second, one second. That's a highly, highly stressed person. It should be 0 0.99, 1.01, 0 0.98, 1.02, because that shows that the body has some flexibility. And they've, they've done an incredible amount of research where if you can control your state, that you change the hormonal level. They've come out with some different um, programs, more from a psychological standpoint, that if, if, you can, if you can connect the head with the heart, because it, it's a concept of entrainment. What entrainment is, is everything is affected by the heart. The heart produces a certain amount of energy that can be measured up to about 14 feet away. So if you're sitting there and someone is coming up to you, you know how sometimes someone gets real close to you and you just, you just kind of, everyone has what is known as their space. Some people, no problem. Other people, you just don't want to get in their space or people can't handle that. What that is, is energetically, you can actually feel that. And that's measurable. One of the things that you can use to measure is with this little unit here, you just put your finger inside of this little unit here, and what it measures is your blood pressure, but also the blood beating, or the heart beating, the amount. And it has a number of different calculations. A lot of the Fortune 500 companies are starting to use this, along with NASA. And what they found is with about 30 seconds of doing some of their techniques, and it's called entrainment, where they get the head and the heart working at the same time. Because I can have the greatest concept, but if I have no enthusiasm, no emotion behind it, nothing's going to get done. I can have a ton of enthusiasm, but if I don't know what to do, I'm going to be scattered. So what this teaches you is actually on how to connect the two up. But well, once you do, then you become more congruent and a lot more powerful. So you can go on the website. It's heartmath.com. The, uh, the computer software program is about $400. And what it does is that it actually quantifies just how stressed out people really are. Again, the more quantifiable that you can become, the more that you can actually start to change to see whether or not what you're doing is working. So this is a real nice tool that you can utilize. So the first one was sensitive to light. The second one was if they get up, do they get uh, a little bit lightheaded? And um, the last one is uh, the actual catching colds easily. What happens if you're under stress, from what I understand, the most volatile or easily broken down uh, proteins is your immune system. This is when runners go out and they push themselves too hard, 
you need the energy source, and they get upper respiratory tract uh, infections quite easily. So what they uh, have found is that if you can change your diet, but also understand how much you're actually capable of handling from a training standpoint, then you can modify and not get colds, which will definitely affect your training. And again, you can quantify it from mild, moderate, or severe, which is overstress. The next one is the same form, except now it's a little bit more quantifiable. So now you start measuring your heart rate is increased by six in the morning. Yes, no. Body fat, if you do any body fat testing, so if someone's body fat is going up and their lean muscle mass is going down, it's called not good, you know? So what you want to do is modify it. That's usually, again, you're pushing, you're overstressing or overtraining. And the last one is a negative postural blood pressure test. And again, this is quantifiable. This is where I was saying that if someone is laying down and they get up and they get a little bit lightheaded, now we can quantify that. And what we do is you take the blood pressure when someone is laying down, they come to sit up, and you take it as they're starting to sit up and you blood pressure up, it should go up. It should go up. Um, if, it, if it stays the same or drops, their ability to produce enough epinephrine and norepinephrine to constrict the blood vessel so it doesn't pool and you don't you know, faint, you got a problem there. So again, that's more biochemical. Now, how do you handle some of these different types of disorders? In your actual notes, there's probably about three or four pages on how to actually treat. Number one, what I find with most people is that they have to decrease the workload the second is you have to use some supplementation. Definitely B6 and um, B5 and also vitamin C are the top three that I usually utilize to try and really turn someone out of this type of problem. There is, um, and that's more male. For females, it seems that when their blood pressure starts to drop, but also they start to get cold hands and cold feet. That's usually more of a thyroid type problem, and stress tends to hit the thyroid. And it's called Wilson syndrome. Anybody heard of Wilson syndrome? Okay, a couple of you. What Wilson syndrome is, is that when someone is overstressed, especially a female, the thyroid gets very, very affected. And T3, which is one of the thyroid hormones, turns into reverse T3. It's called a mirror image. So it's, it's like a hormone, but it's inactive because it's, it's the reverse image of it. So it's not effective. So it may show up normal on a thyroid test, but unless they actually measure reverse T3, it'll never show up. And we're starting to see this more and more and more. So if one of your clients just has a complete you know, metabolic disorganization, they're on a good diet, you know, they're training, they're on some supplements, but nothing tends to happen, and they have cold hands and cold feet, that may be one of the things. So they can ask their medical doctor, maybe get a reverse T3 just to make sure uh, that's not a problem. So you can quantify it with this also. Now we're going to get into some testing. Now, when I'm talking, what I find is um, there's three different levels of information. And the first level, the top gold standard level, is it's research-based and it works clinically. Okay, so we, it works in the clinic and we know exactly why it works. The second level is it works in the clinic. We've done a little bit of research where it's more empirical. We really don't understand it, but we see it clinically. We just either don't have the technology or we don't have the model or paradigm to understand how it works, but, but we know that it does work. And then the third level is the, the uh, doctor or the personal trainer's personal experience of working in the clinic or with certain people for an extended period of time. Now this is known as Ken's infinite wisdom. Okay, so I just want to let you know that some of the things I'm going to be showing you and it'll be more research based, other things is, you know what, this is what I see in the clinic, I have no idea how it works and don't take it as gospel, don't go out there and say, you know, this is the way to do it, try it. If it works, great but always look for answers as far as why does this work. I'm continually always looking and going to different conferences. Went to a great conference uh, last week in Montreal. Stu McGill was presenting some incredible information on, on how to understand back stability. And it was a really, really good understanding from a lot of research and also clinical. So 
to understand the whole concept, especially on weight training injuries, we're going to show you some ideas here. So for the weight training injury, this is, this is Ken's infinite wisdom right now, okay? We have the muscles, the joints, biochemistry, and nerves. All four, one or all four, could be involved with the weight training injury. What I find usually is nerves, muscles, and joints are involved, especially after you do some different types of muscle testing. If it's real severe or it's been chronic for a long period of time, you got to go into the biochemical. You got to hit the biochemical and do some testing there. So now we come down to some different ideas here. Again, don't get caught up with the words sharing and compaction. A sharing exercise or an exercise group is an exercise that has more extremity movement with very little axial or spinal load. And these comprise of the bench press, flat dumbbell flies, cable crossovers. So this is anything with the arms extended and we tend to bring in, or in this position here, but load this way, but there's no load straight up and down. We also have preacher curls, line tricep extension, lap pull down, seated rowing, leg extension, leg curl, seated calf raise, and lunges. This will definitely stress the entire capsule, the muscular system, and the joint system, but it will not compress it. That's a different type of injury. The compaction exercises is an exercise that has a large axial spinal load with some extremity movement. So we have the squat, the leg press, the hack squat, standing calf raise, shoulder press, and also deadlifts. So what happens is spinally, it tends to compress down. Now, this is something that I got from Dr. David Lee, and it explains the difference between shearing and compaction injuries. And in the shearing injury, you'll find a trilogy of a weak muscle, a synergistic muscle that exhibits tenderness to palpation, and a need for a strain counter strain, and antagonist to a weak muscle that tests for the need of travail fascial procedures. In English, what that means is that some of the muscles, there's a disorganization between the actual muscles. And what you need to do is work on the muscle structure. Again, if you're going through this type of load, there's a tremendous load in the anterior delt, subscap, all the rotator cuff muscles for it to work properly. So here's a little flow chart. This is for the doctors and the therapists that if you take the history and you want to take a look at if there's a tearing, an overstretching, a rotational type of exercise, or is it compaction? Is there a heavy load coming down? And you want to find the different types of muscle weaknesses and correct them, or you test the muscles, and almost all the muscles are weak. This is what we tend to see, that everything just blows out. It's just too much force through that actual structural joint, and we need to unload that joint. Then you find the, the different types of muscles, the synergist of the muscles, and the antagonist of the weak muscles. You can either do a strain counter strain or myofascial procedures. You challenge or manipulate the joint, and then you can test the ligaments and go through that. Now this is Janet Travell's work, and the fascia are sheets of avascular, transparent, elastic connective tissue covering and encasing each muscle and visceral organ. And by connecting together, fascial tissue subdivide the body into fundamental units. What you want to do is find out whether or not there is an actual problem with this. And the way that you can test for this is you test the muscle for strength, and if weak, strengthened by normal means, meaning you've got to fix the actual muscle. But if there's an actual fascial problem, this is one of the pro ways that you can utilize to see whether or not there is. There's a lot of techniques out there, active release technique, um, myofascial technique, uh, Guy Voyer is coming in with his fascial technique, and a lot of them, they, they're more subjective or they're more palpatory, but there's really no functional testing. And if you're really, really good, I've been doing active release for about four years, just now, I think I'm finally starting to get it, you know, after about four years. So it's it's very sensitive type of testing. It's, it's, it's a real art. It really is. So what you want to do is you want to stretch the muscle, and if the muscle is quickly tested after, uh, for weakening, if found weak, the fascia is diagnosed, and you want to stretch it out, which is you can use through active release. might be easier to demonstrate this. Um, who wants to come up? Your name is Mark. Oh. <laughs> yes. um, do you have any injuries anywhere? Left shoulder. On this side here? Okay. How about this side? Any problems on that side? Not, Not all that much. 
Not all that much. Okay. Uh, you give me permission to take a look at this and do some testing? Yeah. Great. Okay. Have a seat. Uh, the audience. Now, there's a number of different ways that you can assess different types of fascial problems and see if there's any restrictions. Probably the easiest is with range of motion. So what we're going to do is you just put your hand on top of here, and I want to see how much his arm actually moves. So he starts to restrict up right about there. Okay. Is there any pain when I do that? That kind of jams up there, doesn't it? Okay. So this side moves more than this side. There's a lot of different ways that you can treat this. Um, you can use active release technique. I'm going to show you a unit. It's called a percussion that works again on the fascia. What they've also found with the fascia, and this is from Travell's work, and then George Goodhart also did some work with this too, is called myofascist gelosis. And what happens is the fascia should have some fluidity to it. And sometimes it almost gets into a gel state. And if you're real good, real sensitive, you can start feeling lumps or thicknesses within the actual fascia. It doesn't work correctly. So if you use a certain vibratory rate, you can release a lot of fascial type problems. And from that, you restore normal motion. So we're going to use this unit here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go here, deltoid insertion. This kind of rattles the brain, doesn't it? And ears. Your nose should be getting itchy right now. Now what I'm trying to do is just release the fascia. And it's starting to release now. Now the way that I can tell is the motor tends to change tone. Okay. A little bit sensitive in here. Okay, so I'm just going to go in the back here. Now, do you have to train around injuries because of this? Or train around exercises? Which exercise do you have to train around? To avoid bench. Any military stuff? Do you think you have an injury? Oh, you do? Okay. Okay. So this is one way, and we'll see how much is restored. Does that feel looser? Okay. Now, did I just knock out the Golgi tendon organs? Probably a little bit, but this also stays. This literally changes the entire structure through in here. So that's one easy, simple way that you can utilize it. Another way is you can use different types of techniques. Now we do definitely have some rounding of the shoulders, so partially starting to round forward. This is getting tighter. This is getting tighter. So this, as this gets tighter, this literally tells these muscles here to shut off. So what has to happen is that this has to open up and stretch out more, and then this has to strengthen up also. So this is more strengthening. These would be more of a stretching type of protocols in this area to try and rebalance this. Now, if we were to muscle test and find out what's going on here, this is a test for the serratus anterior. Push up, hold, and that's strong. Push up, and that's weak. Lateral deltoid, push up, strong, push up, and that's weak. So, push backward my hand. For spinatus, push backward, push backward, got some spin, push backward, and it's weak also, that's just the substapularis. Push down my hand, it's definitely weak, push down my hand, push 
coming. That's strong. So we definitely see some weaknesses down through the entire shoulder complex. Every single rotator cuff muscle here is weak. Now, we have some muscles, so I would say that this is a muscle and also a joint type of problem. It's not a specific muscle because a number of them are shut off. Another way that you can determine whether or not we're dealing with has something that's further away from the actual structure. So we'll test this wrist extensors. Bring this up. Hold. That's strong. Bring this up. Hold. Keep up. Hold. Is that pretty strong or weak? So we got to get even the wrist extensors are weak. So we're dealing with more of a neurological thing going on because every single muscle on this side is weak compared to the right. You should be about five pounds difference as far as right to left handedness. So, and I'm not even testing, and I got some muscle testing units and uh, I'm trying to coordinate with some EMG to find out the amount of force that I'm applying with the amount of force that the muscle is firing. And you know, hopefully, over the next few years, we'll be able to get some good research because there really isn't anything out there. But this is what we see clinically. So, this would be the second level where we see this clinically, and a number of practitioners are using this. And actually even teaching this, but you know what? We really don't understand this as well as what we should. I think it has to do with more of the paradigm. This is something I've been trying to identify and find for a number of different years. A little tender here. So on the left-hand side, about C4, C5. It's not moving correctly. I just want to check the other side. And this side is any pain here. So left side is more painful. We turn your head to left. And then turn to the right. He's more restricted going to the left. So more left-sided problems all the way down. Tilt your head. Tilt your head. See the difference? So we definitely know that something's going on here. Now And we see something in this area here too, in the upper back. And there's a concept called T4 syndrome. And what T4 syndrome is, is it's a fourth thoracic nerve that actually exits and apparently goes and reconnects into the brachial plexus, which also helps the shoulder to fire. And anyone who has a bench press injury, you have to fix the neck and also the upper back. Most people miss the upper back and don't get the structures moving correctly up here and the arm is still always weak. It'll still keep coming back. Now why? Because if you take a look at bench press, the amount of load that is on your shoulders is tremendous, especially if you're a heavy bencher. And even worse is you've got to test the actual equipment. So if you can take your thumb and press it into the bench and you can hit plywood or what is known as prehistoric foam, something that has been changed for 20 years. This is what I've seen sometimes in some of these gyms. It's unreal that you're literally compressing and changing all the mechanics in the upper back just by bench pressing because of the poor equipment. So this is one of the things that you want to find out is number one, is it equipment? Because you can fix this, they go back and lousy equipment, they'll, they'll, they'll restart the same problem. So have them check it themselves. Just say, you know what, if you press down and you can feel wood, find a different bench, if that's the only bench, find a new gym. Sometimes you have to be brutal. So these are some of the different things that can occur causing a different type of problem in this area. Now, with the actual fascial uh, technique here, this is how it actually works. Um, let's have you on your back, please. Again, this is more clinical based. This is not necessarily research based. So we have a left-sided problem. We do not have a right-sided problem. But we want to see if there could be a right-sided problem. Again, an injury proofing. So we we'll just go like this. We're just going to have you turn. I'm going to test the clavicular. Come across. Hold. That strong. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly stretch out the muscle. Hold. Across. And it goes weak. So there's a fascial problem in the actual shoulder here causing it to, to weaken under stretch. So that's why I'm not a real fan of static stretching before you do exercise. You should do it at the end, because if you have any dysfunctions in this area, you'll blow up, and I see this all the time, especially with a lot of the power lifters. 
So what you can do, come on up, so now, you can treat again the fascia a number of different ways. And we're just going to treat it with a percussion. Doing it quickly. Have you any back, please? Some cross, pull, stretch them out, pull, across. And he's better. Now, how long will that last? I have no idea. You know, but we definitely know that there is a problem here, and it has to do a little bit more with the fascia. He's got his entire shoulder joint is messed up here. He has a neck problem. It's probably causing a neurological weakness all through the actual arm. So those are just some real easy, simple tests that you can do. Line up. Thank you, Mark. Now, the next one is you want to find out if there's a neurological type of problem. It's called a strain counter strain. And Lawrence Jones came up with this, uh, an osteopath, and it's very, very effective to try and find out whether or not there's a neurologic problem. Because we tend to go, should we stretch, should we not stretch? Because sometimes if you, um, if you do a certain type of uh, stretching program, it gets worse. It doesn't make sense, but it may be inappropriate, or there may be a deficiency that is actually going on. So I need another person to up. Um, any problems anywhere? Left shoulder. It's a left shoulder crowd. Okay. Um, give me permission to take a look at this and do some assessment. Okay. Okay, please. Um, let's have you on your back. Thank you. Now, what you can do is you can find out whether or not there's a problem. And we're going to actually go on the other side because to see if there's a strain counter strain type or neurological disorganization. So we're going to test the same pec, so just turn, come across towards me. Take hold again. It blows out. So something is going on here. Come on up. Sounds right here. How about this side? No. So he's tender on this side. You usually find pain on these types of problems. So what you do is turn just like this, and you shorten the muscle. And what Jones found, less tender, say yes. <laughs> <laughs> what Jones found is that if you hold the actual muscle in a short state, it tends to reset itself inside proprioceptively. Again, this is what we see clinically. The research needs to come out more and more. And it's teaching the body to fire all the muscles appropriately all at the same time. We're starting to see not only just an agonist antagonist type problem, meaning that the opposite muscles aren't firing properly, but we're starting to see co-contraction problems, meaning that the muscles that are firing all through the same motion joint are not firing in its proper sequence or time. Okay. That's tender. Good answer. On your back. Cross hold, cross hold, slowly, cross hold. Okay. Didn't work. Does it mean that the treatment doesn't work? No, it means that there's probably something else going on in there. So it's not to say that this style doesn't work. There's a, probably a lot of different issues. And when you're demonstrating, it's hard to find whether or not a certain things are going to occur. Okay. Well, Whoa. 
which happened on the scene. <laughs> Doesn't work. Is that better? How's that? Is that better? It's got a problem with this carries and this is a series of lump in there. So something's going on rotator cuff wise. That definitely needs to be assessed. Okay, good. Thank you. So those are two different ways that you can assess whether or not there's a muscular problem or a neurological problem. Again, from a clinical aspect. And this is the whole procedure. It's taken out of Dr. David Lee who was kind enough that he used them. Again, he's demonstrating how it actually works. This is called repeated muscle activation, again, clinical. And if you take a look at it, it has a lot to do with training. And you want to find out whether or not someone is capable and how many repetitions someone is actually capable of utilizing. So one of the ways that you can do, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's very open, but one of the ways that you can do it is you can just do the repeated muscle test and then see how long they actually last. Jack, you want to come on? Have a seat. Do you have any problems? <laughs> shoulder? Right. right. Right shoulder. How's your left shoulder? Fine. Fine? Okay. So what we're going to do is, one of the things is that how many repetitions is someone capable of doing? Especially when you're taking them from a therapy session into rehabilitation and then even in the actual training program. So one of the ways is you can actually muscle test it and just force it isometrically and see how many times that they can actually handle it before they actually start to let go and they're not able to hold you anymore isometrically. So one of the ways that you can do this, just bring this up, just like that, good, is I'm going to test again his lateral deltoid and I'm going to test it in a repeated action and just sort of count the reps of how much his lateral deltoid can handle. Okay, so push up. One, push up. Two, push up. Three, push up. Four, push up. Five, push up. <laughs> okay, he starts blowing out around rep five, rep six. Now, he should be able to easily do 20 in this area here. So something is wrong in this. Meaning, and I have to treat you when you're here, uh, meaning that something is, is, is not right. So if he's going to do a set of eight, or say lateral dumbbell raises, you know, anything after five, six, seven, eight, it's almost counterproductive. Especially if you have an injury and, you know, you give someone 10 or 12 reps and they blow out after two, then, you know, you have to literally go have them do two reps and have them take a rest. Two reps, take a rest. Two reps, take a rest. And then they can build up the repetition or the stress or the time under tension, if you want to call it that also, because they cannot handle it structurally. I don't know where we got the concept that everyone should do eight reps or 10 reps or 12 reps. You know, we don't even know if the system is capable of handling it. The biggest fallacy that we actually have within training right now is people walk into the gym with a fully biochemically, uh, energetically, biomechanically, structurally sound system, neurological, everything is perfect. That's about as far away as you can get as possible. People are coming in with a whole bunch of dysfunctions that they've never been treated. And now you're going to load them, you know, with tremendous amount of weight. So again, clinically, you can find out just some repetitions. Could he do more than five reps with a certain amount of weight? Yeah, he could. Would it be good for him? Uh, it'd be easier to, number one, obviously fix the area because it should be able to handle 20. Easy. And then, once it's able to handle it, then you can increase the load more and more. But his system right now cannot handle that. Now, it either can be a biochemical problem, and one of the things that goes into neural fatigue. If he doesn't have the ability, and this is what we see with a lot of different areas, that if the system is tired overall, he won't be able to handle very many reps throughout his entire body. 
So these are people that train, and after they train, they actually feel worse, which doesn't really make sense. So one of the things is to try and find out what is actually going on with the system, and you can do it through the actual muscle testing style. So you want to find out whether or not someone is strong or weak. If it's weak, like the very first rep, then something is structurally wrong. That has to be fixed. And then if they can actively submaximally test for about 10 times, you've got to rule out some diff different problems. Now, again, we're dealing with a biochemical or a neurological type thing. And sometimes you can use vitamin E. Uh, they may have an essential fatty acid deficiency. They may have an aerobic or anaerobic weakness, meaning that, again, certain nutrients are not within the system. And then you've got to find out whether or not there's a problem in that area. And this is a study that came out recently. This is what people tend to do that don't do research, such as myself, is that we have a concept and then we try and find information to back up our concept. That's actually called, you know, poor information. But what we're trying to do is try and find out what is actually happening within the actual system. And we may find the actual missing part and that may be part of it. Uh, but what I learned last week is that things happen, but they may not happen for the reason why you think that they happen. And that's called good research. When you actually go, this happens because of this, and we can actually create that. And we brought some great researchers in this weekend to talk about that. So we brought the clinical aspect, we brought some of the top researchers that I feel in the world here, and then we have the actual trainers to explain how they actually treat the athletes, and then the athletes themselves. So we have Dorian Yates, you know, who has not done any research, but he's done, you know, the Olympia six times and has won it. And, you know, he's basically uh, doing research on himself every day to find out what works for him. Having a discussion with him last night was very, very eye-opening, where just his concepts on training, and they're a little bit misinterpreted as far as how people have taken that. So this is one research paper that actually explains one of the concepts of intracellular ATP levels would decrease, you know, causing regular and cellular death. Alternatively, metabolic accumulation would prevent an increase in the exercise intensity near the end of the actual exercise. So something is going on with the system causing the whole system to actually fatigue. Larry, want to come on up? We're just going to do something else here. Larry has been nice enough to volunteer. Didn't volunteer, I actually asked him. Um, and what Larry's going to do is just do some lateral dumbbell raises, just like this. And again, how many sets should someone do? Don't know. Well, why don't you test it? This is what I've done in the gym for a number of years, and again, this is at the level of Ken's infinite wisdom, but I'm hoping to raise it up a little bit higher and then maybe understand it by doing some good research. So Larry's going to do some, actually, before we start, have you turn, bring some, push up, hold, that's good, push up, hold, that's good. Okay, Larry's going to do some lateral dumbbell raises. How many, what? How many can you give me? <laughs> So we're just going to rest here probably about 60 seconds, allow the system. And what, when you're doing training and you have a training partner, now what you can do is you do your set. You know, after you set, you test to see whether or not it's capable of holding. If it is, if it's strong isometrically, because an isometric contraction is stronger than concentric. Um, if it's strong isometrically, then you can handle the load again. If it just buckles, isometrically, 
you know, within this plane and range of motion, it's probably too tired. And you can change the plane and range of motion. So try and notice that. Actually, just hold on. Push up. Now it's gotten stronger. Try another set. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now we're sweating. Well, yeah, there we go. Come on. Thirteen. Oh, yeah. Fourteen. One more. Yeah, now you're sweating. Okay, good. Okay, put him down. Okay, push up. Pull. Yeah, he's definitely gone. Pull. Okay, so the system is weakened up. And now you rest. And as a training partner, I would kick in my set. And I would do my set now. And then after I'm done my set, you know, I retest them. And we test each other on these different types of exercises. <laughs> so, test it again. Push up. Uh, you know what that means, eh? Pull. <laughs> okay, grab the dumbbells. <laughs> seconds again. It doesn't take long. We've done a bunch of studies that the system actually recovers about 86% in the first 30 seconds. So ATP-wise, creatine phosphate, all the different pathways. So from a biochemical standpoint, it should start recovering. Push up, hold. Still reach. Push up, hold. Reach. Now, when I'm testing <coughs> muscles, you can change the lever system so that you could always win the muscle test. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for something that's intact. And you're going to see a lot of muscle testing this weekend. And this is how a muscle test works, as far as from a clinical aspect, is that I Larry produces a certain amount of force in this area here. And I put my hand on top. And I'm looking for what is known as a, a break type of test, a muscle break type test, where I match Larry's um, pressure all the way, and then I exert about another five pounds more than what he's producing. And I just want to see whether or not he can compensate and also produce that. If he can, then it holds intact. If he cannot, then it falls. Now here's the real interesting part, is I've treated some of the strongest people in the world, Ed Cohn, a um, lot of the top powerlifters at the World Championships, where these guys literally squat a thousand pounds. And when you test them, they, if there's an injury or if there's a mechanical problem, they become extremely weak. Why? Because they're so neurologically efficient. When you're powerlifting, you train the nervous system to fire all the muscles all at the same time. It's not necessarily a hypertrophy type of expansion. Because there's guys out there that weigh 148 pounds and they squat 700 pounds. Now, 148 pounds is not very big. Or actually, very, you know, you look at the person, you go, you could squat that. They have because their ability to contract the muscles is increased neurologically. And if there's any problems within the joint structure and the muscular structure, they become weaker than the average person because they have not trained the specific adaptation to impose demand. They have not trained their nervous system to fire it. So if there's something wrong, it really affects them. Push up, hold, still. 
jump hold. So for him to do another set of lateral raises, the concept is why? He's done enough to stimulate the muscle. We have done enough stress in this area, but I mean, if he was to do another set, it's almost like him walking out in the sun, sunburn, expecting a better suntan. He hasn't even recovered from this set, and you want to hammer him with another set? To me, that doesn't really make too much sense. Now, if there's anything wrong in this area, now, if it was just one side that was weak compared to the other, then you'd have to fix the shoulder. But he was bilaterally strong, and he went bilaterally weak. If one side just went strong, one side stayed, stayed weak, that would be a different type of issue. But something is going on in here. And this is where we can probably do some research to find out what are the capabilities of some people. Because I've seen some people, they can do 10 reps with 275 and bench press, and they can't bench press 300. It's the weirdest thing. And some guys, they get two reps with 275, and they can do 350. And it has to do with the nervous system, it has to do with the joints and structures and how everything fires. So we are so unique, we're so complex, that to just systematically go, you need to do two sets of, oh, let's say, 10 reps. You know, we're just kind of pulling things out of the actual air versus saying, you know what, right now, you can handle this much. And if you handle any more, then you're gonna start creating different types of injuries. So we've done enough stimulus in this area to find out you know, that something is going on, that he can handle it, but now it's time to move on. Because if we test, now here's the important point. You always want to test in the same plane and range of motion when you're doing this, because you can get a false positive or a false negative. So if we go like this, let's bring it down, push up, still, if I change the <coughs> angle a little bit, push up, get stronger, push up, and it gets a lot stronger, just by because he's utilizing different muscles. So when you're doing muscle testing, you have to be very, very specific in the areas and in, in how you actually do it, because you can get altered information, which will, you know, it doesn't help you at all. So when you're doing it, try and be exact, be very, very specific on how you do it, and it'll just raise your level that much higher. Thanks, Len. Appreciate it. Now you can test whether or not there's a problem aerobically or anaerobically in the system. Again, how many repetitions can the person handle in a different type of firing pattern? Who wants to be the next person? Oh, hey, Chad. Oh, great. You too. Okay. Uh, any injuries anywhere? Left shoulder. <laughs> okay. I won't be doing that one. All right, let's have you on your back, please. It's okay to do some testing on you? And yes. Okay, thank you. Now, there's two different types of testing that you can do. One is called aerobic, and the other one is anaerobic. Anaerobic is more fire, more intense, more contraction. Aerobic is more slow paced, basic, long duration. And there are different types of parameters for that. So. Do you have any low back, knee issues here? No, none? Okay. So again, he should be able to handle probably about 20 repetitions easily. My arm should not be able to move his leg. You know. So bring this up. We're just going to test the rectus femoris. I'm just going to go like this. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is just give some repeated contractions. And just see how your system's working here. Okay. So push, hold. That's one. Now I'm doing aerobic testing here. I'm just going to go real slow. Hold. Hold. Hold, 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 hold. You hold really quite well. So, no real problems on this side here. That's the other side. This side. Push up, hold, hold, hold. It's doing pretty good here too. So we're going to test a different energy system, and it'll be the anaerobic muscle testing. It'll be more frequent firing. Just hang on, support yourself. 
Make sense? Okay. Well, now it'll be a little bit more rapid fire, okay? Hold. One, two, three, four, five, six. Come on. Seven. No. Blows it around six or seven. Seven. Hold. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so both of them pretty much the same. Set. So we're going to test the peck and cross bolt. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, now he can handle twelve here. If you're going to do this type of testing, everything should be basically low, or everything should be basically high. Because we're looking for a biochemical type problem here. Um, and his shoulder joint can actually handle it a lot more than his legs. His legs, something's going on here. And I don't know what, but something is causing it to not fire as well as it should. Could be a lower back dysfunction, could be a fascial problem, could be a knee problem, could be a number of different things that are going on to make it not function optimally. My whole focus here is to make you understand you just don't want to work with people that come in with pain. You want to work with people, how can you increase their ability to function better? And what I've learned with the top athletes is a person that breaks down the last usually wins the race or the lift. So you always want to look down and find out and assess how can you find someone and their different types of dysfunctions before they actually show up in an injury. Because by the time it gets to an injury, you know, that's too hard. That's too hard to try and really, because now you've got to fix the injury, and then you've got to make them optimal. <coughs> okay, come on. Thank you. So that's another style of testing that you can do from a functional standpoint. And this is one, a generalized concept. It's very generalized. Where you have predominantly aerobic muscle fibers, in certain areas, predominantly more anaerobic fibers, and it depends on who it is. Certain people have different areas that are stronger, and this can be also a genetic thing. But this is what some of the research that is out there, um, people that have actually looked at cadavers, but the problem when you start doing that, muscle biopsies, depends where you take it, but this is what we tend to see. Now, this is again, neurological disorganization. And what we find with this is that there's some problems with the muscles communicating with each other. And we see this a lot with the agonist, antagonist, or even co-contraction type muscles. Again, an abnormal firing sequence. So certain muscles, when they fire, they turn another muscle off. So it doesn't function as well as it actually should. A muscle suspected of weakening, possible muscle overactivity, you want to treat the spindle cells in the certain muscles. And what you do is you go in and you literally just turn down the tension so that the muscles start to fire in a coordinated fashion. Otherwise you get this ratchet or an abnormal pattern. And you see it all the time in bench pressing or squatting. If someone is squatting and they're coming up like this and they start to torque, well one muscle is firing more, it kicks out, so other muscles have to compensate. And then they rotate and they come back in. Where the bench pressing is like this and one shoulder will drop and the goal you know, you're trying to do whatever it takes to do the motion. So you start recruiting all these different funky muscles and in an abnormal pattern. Now the problem is that you're laying down the neural loops to basically make it fire in an abnormal pattern. So you're habitually ingraining into the system, this is what normal is. So sometimes when you fix it, it feels really weird to them. And you have to neurologically start out to train them coordinated wise so that they can start doing it correctly. Now, what are some different things that you can do to actually um, to recover from any type of uh, training? One of which, and this is what the Germans have used a lot in Europe, is enzymes. And they're digestive enzymes. And what it does is it helps recover and definitely helps uh, prevent the accumulation of scar tissue. But you have to take the 
you know, enzymes post-workout and without food. And you want a full spectrum of enzymes, the maltase, the uh, sucrase, the proteases. The proteases are very, very important. And Dr. Alexander Wood and myself will be discussing that on Sunday morning and he'll go into an infinite detail about that. Another product that is very, very effective is also Tramil. And it's a homeopathic cream out of Germany that uh, about half of medical doctors utilize in Germany. It is very, very powerful bringing down any swelling, bruising, uh, motor vehicle accidents that have, uh, people in motor vehicle accidents have utilized it. Tremendous results, tremendous results. So those are a couple of the supplements that you can help post-workout to prevent the damage. Also, what they found is that when you do exercise, your amount of free radicals that you produce increases literally by about five-fold. So you produce the same amount of free radicals as someone who smokes. So that's why you get into cellular damage, especially for the people that do any type of triathlons or any uh, aerobic type. They produce a tremendous amount of free radical. So that's why a full spectrum antioxidant is extremely important. So if you just take one or two, there's about seven to nine different classes of free radicals that you produce. You only take one, you only take one care of one free radical species. You gotta take care of all of them. And they work synergistically. Uh, another unit that is very, very effective, and I'm extremely happy to bring probably the world authority on electromedicine, or at least one of them. I don't know how you measure that in a competition. Right? Someone says that they're the best in the world. But anyways, um, the gentleman next door, uh, Dr. Dan Kirsch, who's a PhD out of Texas, has done a tremendous amount of research. He's gotten his um, material FDA approved, and it's an alpha stim. And what I learned from him is that with the different types of currents, and I talked to him uh, when I brought him in from uh, the airport yesterday, he says, you know, a lot of people just utilize these different types of electronic units, units haphazardly, like tens, like we are bioelectric people, uh, the, um, species, and the, the way that they know that you actually are alive is they hook up your brain, and they see the little bleeps, electricity is running through the body. If it goes like this, you're not here anymore. So, you know, that's one way that they actually measure whether or not you're alive, or even with the EMG studies, you know, find out if the muscles are firing, if there's activity. And with the different types of um, waveforms, are extremely important. I had no idea. He said a lot of the units that are out there are very harmful. So he's created something that's very close to the body's bioelectricity itself, and it literally knocks out a lot of pain. He deals with um, uh, pain societies at a real high level, and he says you have to treat the brain also. And he's written a number of books, and you clip it. There's a clip that you can put on here, and you use what is known as transcranial, and it literally changes the hormonal level, and it helps people with chronic depression, insomnia, again, lots and lots of research. So he's here. There is a booth outside, so definitely he's going to be here all weekend. Talk to him. Get him to explain this to you, and also he can demonstrate it to you, because it's a completely different protocol than what most people utilize. The fascial work, I've already demonstrated. This is the other unit that I've used in the clinic. And I'm trying to figure out how it works because it works so well, but it's a laser unit. And the, the frequency of the laser is at 635 nanometers which is basically the same frequency from what they understand is cellular DNA replication. So what they found is that if you can introduce a waveform or a light into the system, this is where a um, laser becomes so effective, then it normalizes the system. This is how cells communicate. Dieter Jr., I was in Germany about four years ago, and it has a concept of what is known as biophotons. This guy has three PhDs. Interesting man. And what he has found is that this is how cells communicate. It has to do with resonance and with the frequency patterns and sending light energy back and forth to little packets of, of light. 
And if you can introduce a waveform, or even with a laser, it can literally change the body, the frequency patterns, and also the neurological. With this unit here, you can program it to a number of different settings. And you can see there's two different frequencies here. The bottom one is at 9 hertz, and the top one is at 279. Now, if I change the frequency on this, you can see it's going a little bit faster. So we were able to introduce two different frequency patterns, and the nice part too is that it's in a wave form or in a line form. So I can treat an entire muscular system versus just the little pin. Because I've used lasers before and they can be very, very effective for the appropriate problem. And it seems to work from a proprioceptive standpoint. Now, one of the things that has occurred here today is uh, Dr. Mike Leahy, his plane was canceled. And you probably have seen this, uh, some of the notices out there. So he's coming in in probably about an hour, meaning that he'll miss his lecture. So he's going to do the lecture at 845. But Dr. George Gonzalez and also Dr. Richard Amy, they're going to be showing how to use the laser on fascial problems. And also with Dan Kirsch. Right now he's doing the uh, talk on how to... Uh, the research behind electromedicine, but he's going to be doing some demonstrations as far as what can happen as you're actually getting treated. So if you do want to find out more on the actual laser, they're presenting all the research tomorrow on it, but today they're going to be doing a lot of demos on it. Now, how many people here are to see Dr. Mike Leahy? Wow, okay. So this, this, here's the story. This is what's going to happen. You can go to any sessions that you want. Great. Thank you very much.